Great, thanks very much. So just interrupt me if there are any problems um, with uh, with hearing any rain or or any other problems with you seeing slides or anything else like that. And um, many thanks, um, especially to Sophie and Simon um, uh, and for the introductor um, to um, for inviting me to this session. So. Um, like before I start, I'd like to acknowledge both the Jajarung people of Jara country on which I live, work and play, and the country of the Gunai Kurnai people where I was born. Their country was never ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. Now. Yeah. Just having a bit of problem moving the slides. Um, if you can just bear with me. Um, there we are. Okay. So despite numerous references to trade, the several hundreds of Indigenous peoples um, that covered Australia um, prior to the British invasion and settlement in the late 18th century existed with a high degree of collective sufficiency and local autonomy. There are actually several hundreds of Indigenous nations of tribes um, in Australia a couple of centuries ago. Uh, stone tools such as axes moved from areas with quarries by gift exchange for thousands of years. I interpret these economies and polities in substantivist ways, such as those elaborated by economic anthropologist Marshall Salins in Stone Age Economics. For Salins, cultures plan or um, cultures pattern or plan production and distribution. And he referred to so-called hunter-gatherer societies as the original affluent society. Offering one of the streams of thought, contributing to the contemporary degrowth movement's concept of frugal abundance. Salen's work incorporates a critique of economics in terms of economists' overwhelmingly monetary concept of economy, which conflicts with real life conceptions of efficiency and effectiveness. In other words, planning as if all people and the planet mattered. In this context, I'll use the term earth to cover what others refer to as nature or as more than human nature. But I don't mean it here in a dualistic sense, rather, wholly acknowledging that people are earthly beings. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about how I actually became interested in analysing money and in abolishing money, as in non-market socialism and real valueism. These interests are directly related to concepts, theories and practices of future democracies, economies, and planning, as well as to living in the current conjuncture of multiple dimensional crises and collapses. What I plan to do is to take you on a kind of tour of the overall development of my work on money and post money, in as much as that work might inform your interests in democracy, economy, and planning. From an early age, my moral compass was firmly based on a politics of equity, a universal sense of humanity and justice. My mother was born and bred in rural Australia and she found nature awe-inspiring, loved walking and empathised with all kinds of life. My father and his father, who lived with us for several years, were engineers and conservative politically. At the same time, they were suspicious of business interests. They respected nature, its bounty and its limits. And they counseled working with nature and acknowledging its limits. Growing up in the 1960s, 
as urban, industrial and commercial developments gathered at pace, I became a teenage activist, an advocate of the Save Western Port Coalition for the preservation of ecological values against the construction and expansion of an oil refinery in the local Western Port Bay. My mother was an active member of the local branch of Community Aid Abroad, supporting self-governing community-based development projects in Asia. Such activities showed me how questionable development was and the critical significance of democracy and of planning. They showed the social and ecological failures of commerce, of capitalism, of the abstract ideal and prevailing practice of money making more money. I left home and became active in the women's movement in the state capital uh, city of Melbourne. Women's liberation brought me in contact with union activities and presented deep questions around how to achieve liberation, which directed my attention to money. I challenged not only reformist conceptions of equality, but also the radical wages for housework movement, including autonomous Marxist Sylvia Federici in the United States in terms of women engaging seriously and provocatively with monetary framings of their emancipation. In retrospect, this was quite ironic because autonomous Marxists such as Harry Cleaver and Hans Widmer have strongly contributed to non-market socialism. Non-market socialists argue that socialism, human liberation, requires a money-free, market-free, wage-free, class-free and state-free planetary civilization. For decades, I've identified as an autonomous Marxist and as a non-market socialist. An extended discussion of women's liberation perspectives and arguments, re-money, can be found in Chapter 5 of um, Beyond Money. That's my most recent book. So, in short, um, I argue that engaging in any monetary reforms ties us to the master, to the past, because money in and of itself is incongruent, incompatible with social and ecological values. Monetary values neither express nor reflect ecological values because money and markets construct a purely anthropocentric game between alienated individuals givers and takers, owners and the propertyless, those exerting power over and those acting obediently. The market favours those with money. There is no level playing field. And even if there was a level, level playing field, how can we justify making a competitive game out of who gets to eat what, who is housed here or there, what we wear, where we can go, and how we live. In Beyond Money, I refer to a pre-analytic bun fight notion of price or exchange value, arguing that even if socially necessary labor time involved in production were the basis of price, or we could contrive it to be so, this would not assist in achieving ecological sustainability or a socially just system of production or distribution. In anti-economistic e anti and norm-based ways, I argue that money is neither a proxy for the time taken nor the energy expended to produce a good or service. Instead, a bun fight approach stays with the chaotic and seemingly irrational price making and taking we readily observe and experience every day and accept certain phenomenological tendencies of capitalist economies. In short, monetary evaluations and calculations offer no rational potential in assessing and deciding the benefits and disadvantages of producing to fulfil communal and ecological values and needs. Beyond economics, and going beyond money, 
involvement in the women's movement was particularly significant for developing my thoughts around power and politics. Disillusioned by representative democracy and critical of really existing so-called communisms made me particularly interested in women's liberation assemblies. They're permanently and popularly accountable and rotating positions. They're self-organizing working groups and consensual decision-making techniques. Also in environmental groups of the 1970s, Horizontalist ways of organizing, along with strategic nonviolence and direct action, were frequent practices. All these experiences convinced me that another world was possible using grassroots politicking. Meanwhile, having never completed secondary school and after being a shit kicker in the workforce for five years, I enrolled at La Trobe University in a prestigious Latin American studies program for all my undergraduate and early postgraduate work. Again, political activities, such as taking a strong interest in the rise of Cuba as an alternative form of development and the fall of the socialist Chilean president Salvador Allende's government, pivoted me to history and sociology courses on revolutionary politics. We explored the peculiar experimental politics of the region exemplified in the influence of liberation theology in the socialist Sandinista government in Nicaragua in the 1980s. Such grassroots and community-based politics integrated with pre-Hispanic indigenous governance models operating on the basis of subsidiarity with substantive decentralization and direct democracy. A history major, I quickly decided that Latin America's history for the last 500 years reduced to economic history. Adapting perspectives akin to world systems theories of Emmanuel Wallerstein and Samir Amin, and undevelopment theories such as those of André Gunter Frank. Although sympathetic to Marxist analyses, I was very suspicious of productivist readings of economic dynamics, and then strongly towards what would become circulationist tendencies exemplified by the work of Italian Marxist Riccardo Bellafiore. It was intensive postgraduate research on Mexico's foreign public debt that led me to the possibility of a deep examination of Karl Marx's concept of money as a doctoral topic. As third world debt had burgeoned and a crisis in debt repayments by Mexico and Brazil nearly sent the global economy to the brink of disaster in the early 1980s, I was amazed how no one asked, well, what is money? In the late 1980s, Marx's work with respect to money was under-theorised and marginal to most Marxist analyses. Its study offered me a wonderful opportunity to range over vast amounts of literature on money in general, on how money operated, what money meant, and to crawl through Marxist texts. My doctorate was in interdisciplinary revolutionary studies and my philosophy department supervisor was a lapsed anarchist who had a master's in economics as well as a philosophy doctorate. Although correctly considered economic history, my doctoral study is an interdisciplinary account of the development of Marx's thinking on money. Marx's concept of money is as a holy social god of commodities. Money is a god before which all members of the market-based society kneel. We might question long-established religions and atheists be atheists, but we do not question money at the hub of the wheel of markets. From Marx's point of view, money and the operation of the so-called free market appropriate the money which is um, at the hub of the operation of the so-called free market appropriates the erstwhile capacity for all members of society to directly control what they produce and how they produce it, to decide who produces what and where they might produce and distribute goods and services. 
market-based production and distribution substitutes for us collectively deciding on how we meet, how we cater for our essential needs, say on the basis of commoning and sharing as if no one owns earth and we are but beneficiaries of its bounty. Within capitalist practices, earth is artificially fragmented into units of transferable private property. Each private firm decides secretly what to produce and how much to produce for sale on the market. This is wasteful because consumers have no say in planning what is produced and available on the market, and none of the producers are certain what other producers are creating. There's no planning to meet people's and Earth's needs. There are only defensive regulations aimed at curbing the worst excess of capitalist activities. Monetary growth is a dynamic to which all involuntary abide. Growth is essential to the system because competition means that every economic unit needs to spend as little as possible and make as much as possible just to remain solvent, let alone gain profits and glory. Monetary growth in and of itself means that the wealthy elite must reinvest and the expanding volume of money means that fresh investment also must take place. Consequently, capitalism was driven to imperial adventures in the 19th and 20th centuries, just as the intensity of capitalism advances in the 20th and 21st centuries. The expansion and intensification of capital not only regenerates and exaggerates economic and socio-political inequities, but it also extends and amplifies its impact on Earth. Extractivism, waste, pollution, species extinction, and the erosion and fragmentation of whole landscapes and ecosystems gain pace along with the mere symptom of such ecological imbalances, global heating. To humans captured in these complex and complicated processes and practices of competition and extension, such pressures project a sense of time itself speeding up and going faster. In other words, capitalism propels human and planetary crises and the planet and people collapse. Um, and this is the, the, the collapse that we experience today. It is neither economic um, as in effective and efficient in meeting the needs of all of us as people, nor is it an effective and efficient approach um, in meeting um, uh, what the, the needs of Earth are. Democracy at its best is a mere charade of voting once every few years for a very select number of candidates, most of whom do not offer voters what they might prefer. Monetary power erodes democratic governance. Capitalist states govern the regulation of markets and workers governing of, by, and with capital. Planning follows suit. Resistance, protest, and solidarity merely punctuate capital's progress. Capitalism is not sustainable, democratic, or economic. While studying money at the hub of this system, money being the very socio-political material from which capitalist practices are made, I encountered non-market socialism. I discovered that the early Marx in particular saw socialism as beyond the state and beyond money. So over 25 years ago, I concluded that money was a barrier to achieving equity liberation, socialism, and ecological. Moreover, as I wrote up my doctoral analysis, I was living in eco-collaborative housing in a commune initially set up with a common purse. At that time, conflicts around how much each money, um, how much money each member 
earned for the collective started to impact on their ideally equitable and socially oriented values for decision making. Rather than marginalise monetary influences, certain members were oriented around the monetary implications of how the commune planned its future. I watched the ways economic historians and anthropologists argue that money disturbs, disrupts and destroys community. At the same time, living at Common Ground offered me a powerful and overwhelmingly positive experience of communal co-governance, which convinced me that community-based planning on the basis of subsidiarity and direct control was the most democratic form of politics. In other words, I gained confidence that the capacity of people to reappropriate the power rescinded to money and the market could be successfully recovered, especially in the context of establishing high levels of community-based governance and collective sufficiency. I discovered while living in this and later another eco-collaborative community around the Bend Conservation Cooperative, that ecological sustainability was enhanced by co-governance, by caring and sharing, making goods and services locally, and by doing it ourselves. Ecological sustainability requires caring for our local environs as we use them to support our everyday survival. If we are co-governing, we can limit waste characteristic of production for trade. We can more easily institute models of production for demand, demand identified by householders, checked by a community, assessing how the local people and earth can satisfy the identified needs and plan for local production. Further, furthermore, we're in a better situation to heal earth and heal people from the ravages and damages of capitalism. After I completed my doctorate and revised it for publication, I gained a special postdoctoral fellowship at RMIT University in Melbourne in the Environment and Planning Department. My research focused on the conflict between environmental and monetary values in the ecologically rich East Gippsland forests of Victoria, where unnecessary and destructive logging of native forests, especially old growth forest, had elicited a highly visible and entrenched environmental activism. The ecologically precious Goolungook forest block was the site of the longest running forest blockade in Australia's history. From January 1997, activists kept vigil for more than five years until a final successful raid in March 2002 by the government agency responsible. As I conducted this research, I tutored in environment and planning, um, lecturing especially on ecological sustainability and opportunistically advised as well as studied a rare pilot program for community forest management in this state of Victoria. As I pursued scholarly, um, and activist interests in non-market socialist directions, research in housing and urban planning was my bread and butter work through the 2000s and 2010s. I edited, co-edited and contributed to three collections on sustainability and planning. I was the sole editor of Steering Sustainability in an Urbanizing World, which was issued in hardcover in 2007 and came out in paper back in 2016. And I co-edited with our MIT colleagues these collections, Planning After Petroleum and uh, Sustainability Citizenship in Cities, both published in 2016. So during those um, two decades, um, uh, I engaged in a series of rural um, as well as urban planning projects resulting in a variety of articles, papers and chapters printed um, on community-based uh, housing, sustainability and community consultations, just like a selection of which I've sort of listed there. Um, moreover, 
I was one of three researchers funded by the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute to investigate mortgage default in Australia in the years of the global financial crisis during 2017 to 2019 um, and into 2010, we kind of um, concluded that research. The debt function of money and capitalism is constantly of popular interest, especially housing debt, public debt and foreign debt. Around that time, I was invited to write a long post for Radical Notes, a journal that died in 2012, but past posts are still live. That post attracted over 3,000 hits within the first 18 months, and it drew on material on an activist site that I'd had for several years called the Money Free Zone. And it referred to compacts which I signaled replaced contracts in a society beyond money. At RMIT, I regularly gave one guest lecture per semester to ecological economics students on a world without money, which the coordinator of the course considered useful to expand and even blow their minds. In November 2011, um, a non-market socialist um, collection that I and my late partner, Franz Timmerman, edited was issued by Pluto Press. Life Without Money um, expanded and updated the groundbreaking non-market socialism in the 19th and 20th century um, collection, um, which I showed on a previous slide. Life Without Money presents various tributaries of non-market socialist thinking in the 21st century. I iterate that non-market socialists argue that a genuinely emancipatory and democratic socialism can only operate in a money-free, market-free, wage-free, class-free and state-free planetary civilization. The chapters in this collection both elaborate on the reasons why non-market socialist analyses conclude such a radical transformation is necessary. That's pretty much explored in part one and show contemporary forms of non-market socialism in practice in part two. The book was um, translated into Korean and issued by Book C in 2014. So um, my chapter, Money Versus Socialism, was actually kind of a revised and updated um, uh, version of an article in a 2001 issue of Ecological Economics. In it, I analyse key debates, first in the early years of Soviet power, as key party economists and politicians seriously discussed instituting a money-free economy. And second, the 1960s debate in Cuba about phasing out money. Central to these debates was an interrogation of monetary value as the primary unit evaluating the comparative worth of various goods and activities, and as a primary unit for calculating the worth, the value of production. Che Guevara used Marx to defend his position deriding money, arguing, and I quote, that freedom meant freedom from the forces of the capitalist market, freedom from alienation, and freedom to directly control and plan human life, unquote. In Cuba, the debate oscillated between arguments for and against either material or moral incentives. Autonomous Marxist and um, economist Harry Cleaver contributed a chapter on work refusal, resistance to work and self-organization for alternative post-capitalist futures. This chapter preempted themes um, in part three of his uh, re more recent 2017 work called Rupturing the Dialectic. In the more recent work, he argues that, quote, getting rid of money and markets entirely is not only a necessary condition for getting rid of capitalism, but also desirable in its own right, unquote. He identifies most constraints of capital as monetary constraints. He condemns money as the universal comparator, a universal measure of value, the measure of everything. 
Self-organisation is key to abolishing both money and capital together. By restricting the spheres of circulation of monetary transition, transaction and simultaneously expanding money-free relations, exchanges and activities. Political economy philosopher John O'Neill's chapter, Money, Markets and Ecology, engages with the thinking of Otto Neurath. Neurath was a central figure in the Vienna circle of the early 20th century. He rejected Ludwig von Mises' arguments on rational choice and the necessity of monetary calculations for economic decision making and planning. Neurath regarded Mises as a technical and bureaucratic pseudo-rationalist. Instead, Neurath advocated for an in natura, that's an in-kind economy. Neurath was head of the central planning office of the brief six-month-long Bavarian socialist government that was in November um, 1918 through to April 1919. But he continued to be active in Vienna's socialist politics over the next decade and a half. O'Neill quotes Neurath writing that, and I quote again, it is essential that calculation in kind in the economic plan has to be the moneyless basis of socialist calculation of economic efficiency, unquote. This and further work by John O'Neill applies Neurath's logic to ecological economics and environmental um, policy this century, arguing for deliberative democracy and rejecting market-based approaches to carbon emissions reductions, such as carbon offsets and carbon trading. Ecofeminist Ariel Saleh's The Value of a Synergistic Economy chapter takes an embodied materialist approach. She reflects on capitalism from Indigenous peoples and Global South perspectives to reveal the destructive and co incoherent humanity nature metabolism of capitalism. This capitalist dynamic which is exploitive of earth and people compares unfavorably with the synergistic economies of polycultures and of a non-monetized society nature metabolism. Saleh makes a list of 14 points characterizing a non-monetized society nature metabolism, starting with small consumptive footprints and closed loop production due to the use and monitoring of local environments and ends with the food and energy sovereignty that's implied by autonomous local economies. In his chapter on the gift economy, sociologist, permaculturist, and anarchist Terry Lay argues that capitalist dynamics absolutely can contradict a finite earth, lead to global heating, and need to be resisted and overturned by establishing prefigurative hybrids. Hybrid modifications to capitalism are radical in as much as they are embryos of a new socialist order, writes Slay. Such hybrids include self-organizing community gardens and eco-collaborative communities run by radically horizontalist, just and ecologically sound principles. Grassroots activities like these consciously and conscientiously stew money to become transformative vehicles for a different world. After an analysis of the failure of the Spanish Revolution, 1936 to 1939, Ley advises that those bent on parliamentary ways to a gift economy future would need to avoid, avoid, avoid compromising. And if in a parliamentary majority, they would need to, and I quote, declare the end of money and private property and invite the population to take over control of the means of production, as well as declaring the parliament a house merely of discussion. Now, part two um, focuses on practical cases to argue theoretical points. Adam Buick, 
a longtime member of the Socialist Party of Great Britain, which is affiliated with the World Socialist Movement, outlines his party's consistently money-free position and critiques labour or labour time vouchers, as well as barter and labour exchange trading systems. Prominent member of the humanist Marxist praxis group in Yugoslavia, Markovic engages with key questions for non-market socialists, questions associated with organisation and the satisfaction of human needs arguing strongly for self-determination and self-management, for participatory democracy and efficiency. There's a practical analysis of what is referred to as a labour credit system in Twin Oaks community in Virginia, in the United States. I actually stayed at this community for a month, um, attracted to it partly because Common Ground, where I had lived in the 1990s, was profoundly influenced by the ways that Twin Oaks operated. Moreover, both experiences influenced the community mode of production uh, model that I advocate. Finally, in this practical part of the collection, Claudio Cataneo offers an analysis on the money-free autonomy of um, Spanish squatters. And I particularly like that chapter because politically motivated squatters occupying property land and collaboratively using it in caring and sharing ways, that's in commoning ways, this is really a decisive step in achieving a money-free world. The promotion of life without money took me to New York as a visiting scholar in the economics department at the New School for Social Research in 2012. That gave me the opportunity to, particip to participate in the first international conference on degrowth in the Americas, where I ran a workshop on money and degrowth. Since then, I've been actively involved with the degrowth movement representing a stream that argues for money-free transformations to degrowth. We have a collective chapter in the Degrowth in Movements collection. Research teams, especially located in Germany, engage in visual, visualising um, post-monetary alternatives. Um, the, the Project Society After Money team, funded by Volkswagen Foundation, 2016 to 2018, published this Society After Money, a dialogue. It was a translation of the original German work um, by Bloomsbury back in 2019. And of course, your team also contributed to the um, November online conference on anti-authoritarian communism and post-monetary alternatives. When I was a visiting fellow at the New School, um, for social research in 2012. I also spent two months into, uh, spent several months into eco-collaborative communities. And that became the topic um, of my next Puto Press book, Small is Necessary Shared Living on a Shared Planet. That book was partly also written on a three-month fellowship at the Rachel Carson Centre for Environment and Society um, at um, LMU in Munich. Small is necessary is relevant to this talk because in a very subtle way, it embroiders on the ambitions and potential of empirical cases of eco-collaborative communities of around 20 to 100 people to characterize a grassroots democratically planned economy of a post-monetary kind, explicitly addressing environmental sustainability. By the time Small is Necessary was published, my article, Your Money or Your Life, um, had been um, published in Capitalism, Nature, Socialism and was shortlisted for the 2017 Australian International Political Economy Network Richard Higgett Journal Article Prize. And in many ways, it's a bit of a kind of preview um, for Beyond Money. Um, so I... I drew on chapter three of Beyond Money, a post-capitalist strategy for the script of this short film, Beyond Money, Yenemon. Um, it's been widely circulated and it's been recognised in terms of winning some minor 
Film Festival Awards. My experience as a collective living informed um, this uh, audiovisual sketch of a community mode of production. Some viewers have explained, oh my God, it's a degrowth. But I think that many in the degrowth movement, as well as those advocating a post-monetary world, would envisage um, degrowth distinctly from the model that I present. I advocate the sharing of diverse models, um, but um, I do present a preferred one. And this just under eight minute film aims to give you as a sense of what a world without money might look and feel like. And as you can see, you can freely view that on Vimeo. So what I plan now is to simply read you its script, which I narrate, starting with our contemporary circumstances. Today, we live in complex, frustrating webs of credits and debt. Producing for trade damages nature, increases carbon emissions, destabilizes weather, and leads to more fires and floods. Markets are wasteful and inefficient, causing social and ecological conflicts and injustice. Capitalism elevates banks, budgeting and prices as it denigrates people and nature. So why don't we challenge the system? How about a world without money? A world based on real values, social and ecological values, a world where we co-govern, all together deciding what we make, do and get. Imagine a global network of collectively sufficient cell-like communities, each responsible for the sustainability of the local environs off which they live. Communities of various sizes living within sub-bioregions offering direct efficient ways of fulfilling their needs, producing locally close to end users. Imagine each diverse, empowered community caring for earth, organized horizontally, relatively autonomous and seamlessly networked globally. We have certain personal belongings, but no private property. The entire earth is commons with clear and universal principles for commoning, sharing land through secure and fair use rights. We all contribute a set amount of time to collective production. In return, all our basic needs are met. Each household guesstimates their basic needs annually. Working groups report on the capacity of the local area and capability of locals to fulfill these various needs. We all plan how we will create and care for things and decide together who gets what. Then we work and monitor and tweak how to fulfill those orders all year round. Once established, planning mainly relies on updating previous calculations and taking account of seasonal and natural factors. We produce, say, corn, apples, solar electricity, potable water and clothes for particular already specified people. This is production for demand. We don't need money or markets. Every service or thing created to go created goes to those who ordered them. We discuss and negotiate compacts to produce for and to receive from neighboring or more distant communities those goods and services that we cannot find or make locally. We don't overconsume or go without or waste. We pass on or leave things we don't need in spaces for others to use them. We have collective stores for emergencies and to fulfill unforeseen gaps. So production for trade, markets and money are replaced with local decision making, direct production for demand and distribution on the basis of need. Decision making focuses on diverse, real, biophysical, ecological and social measures and values. The reward for contributing to collective daily tasks is lifelong security of communally meeting our and Earth's basic needs. We engage together respectfully to make decisions on local production and on the terms of exchange, our compacts with producers beyond our community. 
real social and ecological values offer the democratic and materialist terms to replace money as the organizing principle of society. Collectively satisfying everyone's basic needs, we would fulfill our real human potential as creative, active beings with real freedom, real liberation, real power. Now, um, I give the model that I've just sketched prominence in the third chapter of Beyond Money uh, because it forms the function of some kind of vision to which arguments and strategies about transformation in the later chapters refer. In contrast, the first two chapters in Beyond Money focus on money as a barrier to socio-political equity and to ecological sustainabilities and on the functions, forms, and significance of money within market-based societies. The discussions on transformation after chapter three take the perspectives of movements and how they might benefit from adopting money-free visions and organizing to achieve movement goals. The movements are climate justice, women's liberation, alternative technologies, indigenous movements, and Finally, a chorus of movements under the demand of Occupy. I argue that a money-free, in-kind economy is essential to achieve ecological sustainability and social equity that we need and that we need a post-money future as soon as possible, that it's not a luxury. In Beyond Money, I introduce a perspective that one of my next two books um, will focus on the concept of real values and the practice or model of real valueism, which is really just a more constructive and focused term for the ways in which I interpret non-market socialism. A community mode of production is saturated with real values, namely social and ecological values. We cannot restrain carbon emissions or attain a balance with earth without attending to assessing and calculating in terms of these real values. In the community mode of production, discussion making focuses on diverse, real, biophysical, ecological and social measures and values. A tree and a forest are replete with multiple values, uses to people and to ecological systems with intrinsic values often measurable in diverse and incomparable ways. It is in deepening our sense of how to compare seemingly competing, conflicting and defeating values that we can come to orchestrate a balanced relationship with one another and earth. In the last five years, a lot of my work has focused on degrowth in terms of democratic discourse and decision-making, basic needs and planning our futures. Um, I co-edited two degrowth collections, one Housing for Degrowth that came out in 2018 and Food for Degrowth came out in 2021. Um, the Post-Growth Cities um, Coalition um, is a useful resource base I recommend um, and it's a good network to which I belong. Um, and in May, Bristol University Press will issue another title that I co-edited, Post-Carbon Inclusion, Transition Built on Justice. I've got two sole authored chapters in it on degrowth as a strategy for transformation. And that's a kind of key, key theme through um, uh, all of the book, um, but especially in three other chapters. Now, um, over the last um, couple of years, I've contributed to the development of um, our local Mount Alexander Shire Community Climate Transition Plan and an associated Wairarak organisation. And for years, I've convened a monthly Castlemaine Free University program. In 2024, our degrowth central Victoria has an ambitious plan to kickstart a range of other post-monetary and degrowth initiatives, um, which we flagged in um, a post that in this new Substacks um, site that we've put up. And um, these activities encourage and support participatory and deliberative democracy, the establishment of localised economy 
meeting needs directly and healing country and community. Um, during the last couple of decades, I've written a lot about money, debt and post-monetary models, you know, like posts and popular journalistic pieces. Um, I've been interviewed on radio and for podcasts, I've given talks and participated in panel discussions. And that's sort of given me a clearer idea about responses to and critiques of post-monetary thinking. I've observed that many people actually see a lot of problems with money and a fair proportion of them would embrace or, you know, um, do express serious interest in experimenting with money-free relations. Um, other people are attracted to local and digital currencies and community-led banks. Some like the idea of a guaranteed minimum income as cash, and they're turned on by the possibilities of seemingly endless money and commodities that result from applying modern monetary theory. Yet others are confident that simply replacing capitalism with small and medium-sized cooperatives would solve all our social and environmental problems without dispensing with money. Of course, they envisage relying on markets still and generally see money as a relatively neutral tool. In-depth conversations often reveal that such people have, from my respect, a rather shallow and mistaken view of how money works in the economy. They don't appreciate that debt and credit are implicit in monetary economies and the existence of debt and credit, um, which challenges simplistic, say, supply and demand notions of how prices arise and so on. And so much of... Um, uh, beyond money was was really sort of targeting the, those kinds of people who I've engaged with on an everyday level. Um, turning to the model that I presented, while some people think it would be hard to imagine people working without a monetary incentive and reward, others think that models that expect members to do a set number of hours of work in return for their basic needs lack the degree of voluntariness and choice that they feel that individuals should have over their lives in post-capitalism. Practical experiences and personal preferences mean that I actually defend clarity around expectations of community contributions. And, and I see that such expectations are really fundamental um, to planning. I also critique individualistic notions of emancipation. The idea of each individual determining how much they give is, I think, a rather liberal and capitalist notion. The concept of contribution according to talent and effort and of distribution on the basis of needing is most often interpreted in a more communal context, implying communal protocol perspectives and processes. Anyway, um, now I'd love to hear your positions and your orientations and how you define key values and concepts that have propelled and assisted you in framing your research, your paradigms and projects. <laughs> 